and give him the help he needs at the hospital. The Queen Anne County Commissioners are 115% supportive of the EMS operation, which we think is the best maybe in the United States, certainly in the state of Maryland. And there is nothing we don't do to make this thing run as well as it can. So this is a, um, it's a segment that we started um, with QAC Channel 7 on Ask a Commissioner. Commissioner Wilson came, uh, Steve Wilson came with the idea of, of capturing DES and the Sheriff's Office as really an educational piece to our citizens about the day in the life of Department of Emergency Services paramedic or a deputy in the Sheriff's Office. We're heading to the Graysonville area to Wells Cove Road for a local uh, bar restaurant combination called the Jetty. The call was originally dispatched as chest pains. So as I said, our crews there are assessing the situation. And we're still about six to seven minutes out. So we may get an update before we get there, or we may just arrive as they're, they're in the middle of taking care of the, of the patient. Very often at times when emergency services has cases which are of the first priority or could be of priority one, supervisor vehicles are sent as well as the ambulance so that the absolute highest level of personnel we can put on the scene are on the scene. I'm Scott Wheatley. I have the unique uh, blessing, as I like to say, as being the assistant chief that oversees EMS operations. They've started assessing the patient and the volunteer contingent of the Graysonville Volunteer Fire Department engine company has arrived and they will assist with moving the patient, assisting with equipment and BLS medical skills and anything that needs to be achieved for patient care and this once again proves the harmonious relationship we work as a combination system allowing Queens County Department of Emergency Services to be the premier EMS system that they are. Our dispatch center is, you know, takes the call, they interview the caller and they send the appropriate resources. We get every kind of call from, hey, I've fallen and can't get up, literally, to I, my cat scratched me, to, oh my gosh, my baby's not breathing, send help. The dispatchers screen the calls, they give the appropriate information, and they help the citizens who are calling 911. They're giving directions and they're giving medical treatment prior to the first responders arriving. Our dispatchers are truly the first first responders giving the care. I think in the county it's well understood we don't have a hospital. So what we have decided to do some years ago was to create the absolute best transport system that anybody in the world could put together. And that's what we are doing and are going to continue to do. It's uh, If you're having a heart attack or some sort of life-threatening situation, of which we have, we have on average three, four, five imminent death calls per week, plus another dozen very life-threatening calls per week. So we have a system together that gives you the absolute best uh, chance you have to, to get to a hospital. The good news is Queen Anne County is within reach of some of the best medical facilities in the world. So if we get, if we can get you there quick enough, and we do, we can almost always keep people alive. Our success rate with cardiac cases is over 95 percent. It sounds as though our patient has already been loaded into the ambulance. They're actually consulting with a cardiac center right now. EMS 1's arrived. Arrived EMS 1. We kind of always have to park to make sure our crews and our equipment are protected. Just in case the crews are in there stabilizing the patient, getting ready to prepare them for transport. But it came out as a chest pain. It is a chest pain, but this gentleman attempted suicide last night by ingesting some toxins that are very bad for his system. They're consulting with poison control in the local cardiac center and they're preparing to transport to a hospital nearby called Anne Arundel Medical Center. This is truly a life-threatening situation that needs to be corrected. And uh, we've got the top-notch crews on board doing this to assure that this patient will have the best outcome possible. Hold up. You're going to Anne Arundel? Okay. Okay. Right now. So I gave them a little synopsis. Anything you want to say as you get ready to go? Or? 
over right now. Um, just trying to take the best care of this yeah. gentleman as we can, and we're getting him down the road, get him, get him the help he needs at the hospital. He's really brave to car to come in, isn't he? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. All right, sir. Be Thank here. you. Be, be careful. I think this is great because obviously our first responders, our law enforcement men and women that serve in our community um, do it, some situations at great risk to their own well-being. And it's just another way to show the viewers of QAC Channel 7 and the folks that live in Queen Anne's County what it's like to be a first responder here in our community. Obviously a lot of the efforts that law enforcement does that most people don't see which is the crime prevention efforts behind the scenes, the resource deputies that are in the schools that are actually you know, interacting and networking with the students that are out there. And that's a huge key component because we get a lot of information from the public that trusts law enforcement. But one of the big questions that we always get is, what's the difference between like a sheriff's office and state police versus town police and things like that? So one of the big things is, you know, obviously state police is a state police agency that has jurisdiction throughout the entire state of Maryland. And they do a lot of traffic enforcement, but they have a lot of specialized units too, like a homicide unit, crash reconstruction units. They do a lot of the tr truck crashes and things, and a lot of specialized units that they can detail people to. Town police work for a town council or a town government and are the police department for, and primary law enforcement for those smaller town jurisdictions. Sheriff's offices are kind of unique because one, they're elected by the people for whoever they want to choose to run their sheriff's office. But there are two things. The number one thing is the constitutional duties that a sheriff's office has, and that is mainly protecting the courts, the judge, warrants, and process service. But I've got to give a lot of credit to Sheriff Crosley and Sheriff Sewell, who were here before me, who actually took law enforcement from just the constitutional thing to a full service police department, which we are today. And there's always things that you can change and improve on, but we've come a long way. We've done a lot of great things. And thanks to the commissioners for your support with technology and a lot of other things, uh, we're probably one of the most premier law enforcement agencies out there. And it's that technology um, that helps solve cases. And you keep know. our community safe. Yep. Absolutely. So you do a, a little segment with QAC Channel 7. Fugitive Roundup. Fugitive Roundup, right, exactly. Is this something that, that you introduced? Yeah, you know, back in the day when we first started with Queen Anne's County's Most Wanted, we actually took and used to just have the camera and we would hold up sheets of paper and we would read off that. So Lieutenant Dale Patrick, myself, wanted to get people that were wanted off the streets to reduce our warrant load. So we actually came up with this program. The actual Fugitive Roundup actually came from a TV show that came to us to use their wheel. So that wheel we didn't pay for. The TV company actually donated it to us, filmed their little TV show there, and then moved on and left the uh, wheel for us. So we continue to use that wheel, which is good. There's a handful of folks that I've spoke to that it, like watching that yeah. because, you know, we do live in such a small community and, and there is the opportunity to see somebody that, that may be wanted or even perhaps somebody who may, may be wanted um, for failure to appear in court and didn't even realize it and then they see themselves on TV sure. and turn themselves and, You know, our goal is not to shame anybody. I mean, that's not, that's not why we're there. But, you know, most people know that they're wanted and a lot of people avoid turning themselves in if they would just take care of their paperwork like most responsible community members do. I mean, if something happens, we address it and deal with it. But I will say one thing, Queen Anne's County, we, have, we don't have a lot of real bad crimes here. Other jurisdictions are like, oh my God, I saw that fugitive roundup and all you have is suspended drivers or somebody with you know, less than 10 grams of marijuana. Uh -huh. And I'm like, that's, that's what we have. You know, and we're very fortunate. We've got a great community. We're safe. We have something that is called an MRAP, which is an armored personnel carrier vehicle that we got donated to us a couple of years ago. So we've actually had to deploy it several times, uh, more often for reasons you may not think of, uh, very heavy snows. Like for example, when we had uh, a blizzard that blanketed the entire county with several feet of snow, it actually has a very high ground clearance and it's very heavy. So it's actually able to go through larger or deep amounts of snow with very little difficulty. We actually found where this vehicle was able to push through drifts that were six and seven, eight feet tall, whereas other heavy equipment from the county could not make it through that and this vehicle was able to push through those. How did the county 
uh, come to own this vehicle? Sure. So it's actually military surplus. Uh, we acquired it from uh, the U.S. government for the cost of one dollar, actually, a substantial savings considered <laughs> if the taxpayers had to pay for a vehicle, this would be well over a million dollar vehicle, obviously. Are there other jurisdictions that know that we have this? And sure. And it, there absolutely are. And as I said, the vehicle has multiple uses. So it is an armored vehicle. It was used by the military. So it actually has ballistic protection, the glass and the metal, the entire vehicle affords protection to the crews inside, whether it be people that we're rescuing, whether it be civilians that we've taken out of a, a dangerous situation or our tactical team members. Uh, we can also put uh, three backboarded patients in here if we had to transport someone that was injured on a backboard for spinal immobilization, we have the ability to do that as well. Uh, that being said, we've been requested since it is unique to the Upper Shore, it's the only vehicle of its kind on the Upper uh, Delmarva Peninsula, we have been called to other jurisdictions when they've had active shooter situations or persons that were armed and it would be very, very dangerous for even um, trained and equipped police officers to approach someplace where someone's in a fortified position with a weapon. We have to have the tools to respond, you know, and I got a lot of heat a while ago whether we had a drone or a boat or whether we had this armored personnel carrier vehicle, but you know what? I can't imagine going to a scene and not having a tool. It would be like doing your job without a pen or something like that. You know, when you need it, you have to have it. Right. We're very excited to start a child care initiative here in Queen Anne's County with our Department of Emergency Services. And we are focusing on uh, preventative care for children. We just recently were very lucky enough to sponsor five of our employees in a car seat initiative. They are now official car seat inspectors, which is a big deal. It's a five day course that they had to go through and they will have continuing education as well. And the important thing, Commissioner, is when I come, just like last year, I asked for a little boost in our training budget, our, our public outreach budget, this is exactly why. And if we can get our message out to the citizens, because the goal is we want them to know us before they need us. Yes. We don't want to walk in and startle them with all these people coming into their house. So if they know us and they understand the tools that we're bringing in and the medical and that we're going to touch, especially small kids, they're scared of being touched if there's any kind of sickness or illness. So we try to do as much education and public outreach as possible. All of our uh, paramedic ambulances and supervisor units, our deputies, all of our vehicles have this uh, technology. So not only is it a mapping system that allows us the quickest route to the calls, but all the information that's uh, obtained by the dispatchers is fed into the screen. So we can actually read updates as the dispatchers are questioning the patients on the conditions. The reason Queen Anne's County is able to have what's probably the best EMS service in the east half of the UF, US, if not anywhere, is because Maryland has the highest demographic income of any state in the union, and Queen Anne's County is the fourth highest. So even with the fourth lowest tax rate, which we have of all the counties in 22 in the state, we are able to maintain a really first-class operation uh, and keep best equipment we can provide in the system because that way anybody who gets sick is going to get to the hospital in good condition and there's nothing we do that we take more seriously. Probably the last thing was the laryngoscopes and then we are looking at uh, live blood. Yeah, there, there are some things that we're exploring. We got the video laryngoscopes. We also are one of very few counties in, in Maryland that do ultrasounds in the field uh, to detect bleeding in the abdomen and there's a lot of advanced things like that and I am encouraged to look for the next best thing yeah. and sometimes gadgets are hard to come by with technology as fast as it something new comes along something new comes comes out to replace it so one of the biggest things we're looking at right now is something simple because we do have a diverse population is we're looking at putting uh, language interpreters a little uh, small computer on each truck that allows you to have a conversation in real time if we have a language barrier and that would save a huge amount of time and and the next thing of course is that we're researching and only in the research phase right now of doing whole blood for trauma patients and patients that are bleeding out and that would be something that would change the way we do business totally in this county our crews bring the ideas we go to conventions we reach out to vendors, we try to get as much information as possible while being diligent about the taxpayer's dollar. 
we, we have to be diligent. We, I don't have a free account to spend, but we have the monies available that meet the demand of the system. Yeah. And that is very rare for any county government to be able to say from EMS. Putting a feather in the commissioner's cap say that a lot of DES departments have to beg, borrow, and steal to get money. I call Wheatley and Chief Haas up about every two weeks and say, what better equipment technology, protocol, drug can we put in our equipment to make this thing work better. Basically, the, the entire operation, I'm proud of the employees, I'm proud of the morale, and I'm proud of the fact that we can say in the United States we have about as good an EMS system as anyone could put together. About half the sheriff's office is actually out on patrol. We've recently restructured what we're doing. Um, the deputies work a 10-hour shift. So a lot of times the deputies um, will actually get issued a roll call sheet on their laptop in their car. And when they do get this roll call sheet, that'll tell them every day what the hotspots are in Queen Anne's County, where to run radar, what the specific uh, crimes are that are going on in those areas, whether it's thefts from unlocked cars, or whether it's you know somebody who's wanted who's been seen in certain locations. Our citizens are our eyes and ears of what's going on and and then so when they do reach out to us and with an issue or a problem that they need help with you know that's one of the best parts of this job I imagine for you as well. Yeah no I think for both of us and you know input from social media is okay but input from social media is not the best way because sometimes we don't see that you know and we don't have I mean I literally every night spend an hour and 20 minutes going through social media, all different pages and things like that, trying to see what's going on because I want to have my pulse on what's going on in the community. But a lot of times I miss things that are three or four days old and I wish I knew about it three or four days ago. Mm -hmm. You know, but I, so people need to still make those phone calls, send those emails. And I know I speak for the my fellow commissioners that, that when folks send us emails or texts with questions or concerns about what's going on in their part of the county where they live, um, it's an opportunity for us uh, like yourself, to, to react to an issue, call in um, county staff, whether it be law enforcement or, or Department of Public Works or Parks and Recs, to, to fix a problem. When it comes to the sheriff, his department and his command staff um, do work diligently to try to get uh, the resources that they need through grants and, and uh, other avenues other than the taxpayers' dollars. But Queen Anne's County has the fourth lowest property tax rate in the state of Maryland. 23 counties in Baltimore City, we have the fourth lowest property tax rate. So to get the coverage that the sheriff was, was talking about earlier, I think we're getting a tremendous bang for our buck. It's a daunting task, uh, one that the commissioners accept gladly. Uh, but there are some budgets that are a little bit easier to get through, and the sheriff's is certainly one of them, without a doubt. That is a question which the commissioners cannot answer at this point, because we don't yet know what our revenue is going to be. The Board of Ed has always shared in whatever revenue growth we have, and that will continue in the future, I believe. They are... Uh, they are as important as any element of our government, and we always share equally in these different divisions. And so if the revenue comes in bigger, they will get their piece. Mm -hmm. And, and then, of course, the opposite. If revenues are down, then they're going to share in the cutting. Well, that's true, but hopefully that will not be the case. We've had uh, seven or eight years of growing revenue, and the expectation is there should be slight revenue growth this year also. Davidson Farm Park? Yes. Um, so it's been going clear back to um, when I served uh, my first term, 2011 to 14. We looked at, uh, even had some uh, drawings done on building multi-purpose fields there at Davidson Farm Park. Um, not uh, certainly uh, off the drawing table by any means, because I truly believe um, that there is a need for more multi-purpose fields in our community. Uh, can, bring larger scale tournaments to our county. So there's lots of um, additional income for local businesses, hotel stays like that. So tournaments are a great revenue generator for our community. So having multi-purpose fields built there uh, is certainly um, a hope of mine. Uh, I know that currently the, um, the spoils from uh, putting the AstroTurf, 
or the synthetic turf at our high schools, the spoils from the old fields have gone there. Um, and I know that we're working with, uh, Parks and Rex is working with um, some folks that are interested in building a pump track for bicycles there and also some trail uh, for um, the high school composite bike teams that we're forming here in Queen Anne's County to train and, and compete against other high schools. Um, so there's some projects that are looming for Davidson Farm Park um, and um, we'll um, have more on that and, and how that's progressing uh, at a later date. We've had two groups of people that have come to us and asked it if we would uh, <clears throat> make illegal or discourage the use of plastic. And we are very conservation minded and would like to do so. But what we told these folks was this. The first thing you need to do is go out and look at the store's experience and the public experience mm -hmm. and see if they're willing to go ahead and you know cut back on the use of plastic because this is not entirely a top-down decision for us to make. It has to come from a want of society to, to get that done because if people are not using plastic, they're going to have to bring bags of their own, and that's a decision that the public and the stores, but we would more than happy to cooperate with that if there's a public will to do it. Is that fair to say? I, yeah, I think probably yeah. the best source of information, as Commissioner Wilson said, um, would be to check with the grocery store chains that are that are operating here in our county and, and find out are they seeing a trend of folks bringing their own bags uh, to cart their groceries home in lieu of choosing plastic. Well, I think that with this upcoming lane closure, there are very likely to be more backups, and I, it would be very helpful if we, if somehow in the state, more public transportation was arranged. For instance, extra busing for North County or Central County in across the bridge, if we could combine that in buses, it would be very constructive for the county and help with the lane closure issue. Yeah, I, I certainly, uh, um, a good idea if you're going to try to reduce the number of cars that are commuting across the bridge. Yeah. If there is um, a, a other means of transportation that can get our citizens across the bridge, because again, that that lane closure, uh, you know, the capacity that Route 50 mm -hmm. can handle and the capacity that the bridge can handle at any given time are two different numbers. So you're going to e actually reduce the number of cars per hour that the bridge can handle heading westbound, but you're not changing the capacity of cars that will be using um, the bridge. So it's, well, it'll be interesting to see what happens moving forward. Yeah, the commissioners were not advised about this lane closure. We certainly do not agree that it should take place at the times and hours and length that, it's, that this seems to be happening. And we are uh, as unhappy or more than the public is with this situation. The county has no expectation of needing to raise taxes or fees at this time in general, that our revenue growth and expenses are approximately coordinated and at the moment the county is in very strong economic condition with no particular expectation of, uh, of any uh, tax increases. And we have done this by being very cautious and conscious of uh, our expenses and, and uh, responsibilities. How about um, how about the uh, projected recession that could be uh, looming in the next year, if, year and a half, two years? Were that to happen, the county has the highest level of free cash of any county in the state of Maryland in order to meet up with any shortfall we have. So unless it was a very unusual recession, we should be able to wash on through it without any increase in taxes or cut of services or or cut in labor. Uh, so hopefully what we've done is to anticipate whatever problems we think we would have and meet them. What's your favorite cookie? <sighs> Macaroons. <laughs> Hands down, yeah. And macaroon surpasses all other cookies. Yeah. How do you feel about that? Uh, well, <laughs> Steve, 
Yeah, I'm a chocolate chip cookie guy. <laughs> Please. <laughs>